far on the appropriations bills. We had a successful completion yesterday, and we are continuing in the energy and water appropriations uh, measure uh, today and as we come back next week. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman for uh, uh, that information. I want to say to the gentleman, uh, I would disagree that there's no plan. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen, the ranking member of the Budget Committee, did in fact have a plan, uh, presented that plan. It was voted on on this floor of the House. It did not prevail, uh, but that is a plan uh, which, frankly, uh, was a more balanced plan from our perspective. Obviously, the House did not agree with that. A more balanced plan that, in fact, uh, would have uh, uh, reached uh, uh, balance uh, in, in fact, more quickly, I believe, than the, than the Ryan plan. So we do have a plan. We presented that plan. We offered it on the House floor. I, I voted for that plan. The overwhelming majority of uh, the party uh, uh, on this side of the aisle voted for that plan. So there, so there is a plan. So I think the gentleman's not correct in saying that we haven't offered a plan. We have. A uh, plan has not passed. The gentleman's absolutely correct on that. The Senate and the House have not agreed on a plan. Uh, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to agree on a plan. I think that's uh, unfortunate. Uh, but perhaps we can agree on the appropriation bills. Uh, we are hopeful that the appropriation bills will be uh, agreed upon consistent with the agreement that we thought we had at the funding levels of $1.047 uh, trillion dollars for discretionary spending. Uh, the bills that have been offered are closer to that number. Uh, then uh, I think that we will find as later bills come, uh, we don't know that, but uh, that's the speculation. The Senate has agreed that we ought to mark up at uh, that figure, but we haven't marked up to that figure in the appropriation bill. Uh, but if we do the, uh, if we complete the appropriation bills, as the gentleman says he wants to do, I think it uh, would be uh, good to do, is the gentleman's perspective that we will mark to 1.047 or 1.028. That's a $19 billion difference, substantial difference. Uh, we understand that. Uh, and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats have agreed to mark to the higher number. Can the gentleman comment on whether or not at the end of the day we'll be able to get agreement on what the agreement we thought we had uh, in the Budget Control Act? I yield uh, to my friend. Mr. Speaker, I just say to the gentleman, he and I have discussed this before in these colloquies, uh, and I, I would suggest uh, turning attention to the Senate that hasn't even begun considering its appropriations bills, uh, to even to suggest that we would come to an agreement with the Senate. I think, you know, the Senate's got to really start to do its work uh, as far as the appropriations process is concerned. I yield back. I don't have a rebuttal to that, so I will <laughs> yield back my time. <laughs> uh, the gentleman yields back his time. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet at noon on Tuesday next for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Kansas seek recognition? Unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. And revise and send so granted. Mr. Speaker, I rise to honor the life of a true public servant from the great state of Kansas. Kansas State Representative Bob Bethel represented the 113th District in the State House and hailed from Alden, Kansas, not too far from the farm where I grew up. Representative Bethel served the people in the, of Kansas in the State House for 14 years and was a staunch advocate for education, health, and long-term care. His distinguished career includes serving as mayor of Alden, as a pastor in his community, a school principal, and a director of college admissions. Additionally, Bob was a private business owner operating long-term health care facilities. I was saddened to learn of the tragic car accident State Rep Bob Bethel suffered while driving home from the Kansas legislature recently on Sunday, May 20th. I served with Bob for eight years in the Kansas House, and I always remembered him as a kind and caring man who never took himself too seriously, always wearing his trademark Mickey Mouse ties. A true public servant, Bob, we are going to miss you. Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Uh, thank you.
Do I ask what purpose? Or just um, under the uh, speaker's uh, announced policy of January 5th, 2011, a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always an honor to speak here on the House floor. And there's been a lot of interesting attention that's been given to an issue of whether or not the uh, Obama administration supports Israel, doesn't support Israel, is more supportive of its enemies. Uh, and apparently, according to an article in the Weekly Standard this week, uh, May 30th, 2012, by Daniel Halper, um, and I'm quoting from the article here, it says, quote, Obama stressed he probably knows about Judaism more than any other president because he read about it, unquote. Hyretz reports, quote, he wondered how come no one asked Speaker of the House of Representatives John Boehner or Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell about their support to Israel. Article also says, similarly, he, the president, said to the group, I am not going to tell you again how I even feel about Israel, but why are we still talking about it? He then suggested that he should not be questioned about his commitment to the Jewish state because, quote, all, of, all his friends in Chicago were Jewish. I, I think there's a lot to be learned when we read people's comments or learn of people's comments that were not scripted, that were said just off the top of the head. Nobody put it in the teleprompter. It's not somebody else's words. It's words directly from the individual in question. And so I got to say, you know, the president says all his friends in Chicago were Jewish. Uh, I learned a lot from that. I didn't know that Jeremiah Wright was Jewish. I mean, I don't, I meet people all the time. It never crosses my mind, you know, what descent or the, uh, is this person. Uh, so it's fascinating to me to find out from the president that apparently Jeremiah Wright was Jewish. Uh, Tony Resco that got the lot right next to the president and got them a sweetheart deal of some kind. Uh, that real estate deal, even though Resco's gone to prison, um, I, I didn't know Tony Resco was, uh, was Jewish. And Bill Ayers that unashamedly uh, blew up a bomb hoping that he would kill people back in the 70s. Um, man that gave uh, Barack Obama his first fundraiser at his home. I, I didn't know what um, lineage Bill Ayers, but according to the president's comment, all his friends in Chicago were Jewish. Uh, apparently Bill Ayers must have been Jewish as well. So it's interesting to find out about people's friends and uh, who they are and what their background really is. My background, having been at one time um, early on a prosecutor, I've been a judge, I've been a chief justice, it helps me, some of us that are a little slower to work through and plod through material methodically, it helps me uh, to make a chart. And I know having uh, collected the notes of jurors after they had heard long cases. I guess the longest case I tried was about 10 weeks long, a murder case, as a judge. But it was always interesting to read notes that jurors had left. And so often they would take evidence and they would make notes of evidence and try to decide what category that evidence fit into. Did it support what the prosecution was saying, since they had the burden of proof, or did it support a defense contention or an affirmative defense, that kind of thing. And so I found uh, this week, since I read that article, 
about the uh, president's defensiveness, and, and, and that it'd be interesting to take and just run through some evidence so that we could try to decide, since the president says um, he's not even going to uh, comment how he feels about Israel anymore, I think it'd be helpful to go through and look at the evidence and decide whether it supports the notion that the president is very pro-Israel or that he's not. Uh, when, when the president said uh, that he wondered why no one asked Speaker of the House of Representatives John Boehner uh, about his support for Israel, well, uh, I know uh, that Speaker Boehner and I have had some rather profound disagreements, um, and that I'm sure will continue. But when it came to the issue of Israel, I... I can't, I couldn't come up with anything that indicated any lack of complete support for the nation of Israel. In fact, um, I've been pushing for two years, or, well, two years ago I started pushing to get Prime Minister Netanyahu invited to address a joint session of Congress here in this very hall, and um, I know when I approached Speaker Pelosi about it, she had, uh, this was June of 2010, and she thought it was a nice idea, but there just wasn't going to be time to get that done before the end of the year. We had so much of on, on our plate, and I think we did have a lot of courthouses we hadn't named yet, so we got those done. And then when Republicans took the majority in 2011, um, I redid a letter, got lots of Republicans to sign on, and as uh, the Speaker asked Prime Minister Netanyahu to come address the House here, and um, as best I understand it, got the Majority Leader down the hall, Harry Reid, to go in on it so that it would be a joint session. So. You know, all the evidence indicates complete support by uh, Speaker Boehner for Israel. I really haven't been able to find anything to the contrary. But again, since the president says he's not going to comment anymore about how he feels about Israel, I thought it'd be good, and it sure helps me to go through and just chart out evidence and which way, which notion it supports. So I, I went through and we took um, points from stories, uh, whether it's on television, in the news media, on the internet, that appeared to have good basis for being factual, and uh, just decided to chart out, is this evidence that President Obama is for or against Israel? A and does he love Israel or does he love Israel not? And so we know that back in 2011, most of us heard the comments. Apparently, they didn't know the microphone was live. When um, Prime, Prime Minister Netanyahu came up in the comments by President Sarkozy of France, uh, when he made a comment such something about what a problem Netanyahu was, and President Obama made comments to the effect that, Oh, yeah, well, you know, I have to deal with him every day. Um, it was clearly belittling of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I know people that heard the comment thought, ooh, if you're Prime Minister Netanyahu, that's got to hurt to hear the guy that you may talk to quite a bit uh, agreeing with another leader that Netanyahu is just a real pain to deal with. So it really doesn't show a love of Israel, really. That was more of a loves Israel not. And then the comments in 2011 when Prime Minister Netanyahu last year was on his way uh, coming to the United States. He was going to speak to an APAC convention here. And it seemed to be rather short notice. The president hurriedly consulted with um, people that he trusted, uh, Imam Majid, who is president of the Islamic Society of North America, 
Uh, of course, they are a named co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation prosecution uh, for supporting terrorism, ISNA, Islamic Society of North America. He's the president of that organization. And we'd heard on the news that uh, Imam Majid had been consulted. And in fact, Imam Majid, the president of this co-conspirator supporting terrorism, uh, was even invited to the inner sanctum of the State Department uh, to, to hear the speech that he had apparently, uh, according to sources, had helped give advice to President Obama on. And so during his comments, President Obama says that Israel should return to its 1967 borders and people that are familiar with Israel and know the history of that area, including going back uh, to 1,000 or so B.C. when King David was the ruler in that land, uh, 1,500, 1,600 years or so before uh, a man named Muhammad uh, came to earth. But anyway, he's suggesting that Israel, in those comments, should return to these borders, which military people indicate make Israel indefensible. That's why they were so subject to attack, uh, attack in 1967. So that really um, was not a comment suggestive of a love for Israel. That, that's really more of a loves Israel not. And then the Obama administration, uh, they have wholly failed to condemn any of the Palestinians' building of illegal settlements. Uh, you know, here the Palestinians keep building and building in areas that are not authorized, there are illegal settlements being built, and we hear not one single word from the Obama administration about the illegal settlements being constructed by Palestinians, and that... Um, um, also included his criticism of Israeli housing plans for East Jerusalem. And so that's really a loves Israel not on that one as well. You've got the Obama administration's decision to eradicate missile defense programs that would have helped Israel. There are articles, information about that. Obviously, since it didn't help Israel to have eradicated missile defense programs that would have helped Israel, despite some that would, uh, that actually is an act that indicates loves Israel not. Uh, now, I think it was a wonderful thing that Prime Minister Netanyahu in 2010 was invited to the White House. That was a great thing. I, very good of the, of the president to invite him. But all of the reference to that visit seemed to make very clear that when the president intentionally snubbed the prime minister who had traveled all this way to meet with the president, and he was left waiting for an hour or so, while the president went off with his family, they knew that Prime Minister Netanyahu was coming, and he came by invitation, and yet the president created an intentional snub, unless his staff, of course, is so incompetent they didn't let him know that the leader of our dear ally Israel was waiting in the White House to visit. But uh, anyway, he went and dined with his family, and also it was considered by most who know about international relations to be quite a snub that although the president's been pictured with all kinds of um, folks in the Middle East that would just as soon Israel be eliminated from the map to refuse to have a picture with him, which was the norm, really was an indication of, of love Israel not. Now, Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton announced that the Obama administration planned to send $147 million to the West Bank and to the Hamas-run Gaza Strip. Well, Congress had made very clear, since we have the purse strings under the Constitution, that that money, there should not be money being sent to any organization that is supportive of terrorism. Hamas is a named organization that supports terrorism. 
And yet, this administration has decided to send a group who has made very clear they want to see Israel eliminated, wiped off the map, sending them $147 million uh, is not really evidence of a love for Israel. So that would go in that category. Over here, you also have President Obama stating that all his friends in Chicago were Jewish and that he was sometimes accused of being a Jewish puppet. Well, for those people who accused the president, according to the president only, of being a Jewish puppet and that all his friends in Chicago were Jewish, well, that is some indication of a love for the Jewish nation of Israel. The president's administration, though earlier this year, leaked to the Washington Post of the time window in which Israel would take out Iran's nuclear program. Well, any ally is supposed to know that if you go leaking information, putting it out there in public, that damages an effort of your close ally to defend itself, that's not a good thing. It's not a sign of love and affection for an ally when you leak information that would prevent or harm the efforts of that ally in defending itself. So that, that's just, that was not a good indication of a love for Israel, more of a love Israel not. And then also the Obama administration had a leak to the media that Israel was going to use the Azerbaijan airspace to take out Iran's nuclear program. Well, if that's the kind of thing you do for friends, America's not going to have a lot of friends for very long because our friends will know, wow, Israel is said to be one of America's closest allies, and yet they're leaking information about private deals that their so-called ally has made to try to defend themselves, that surely would fall into the category of love is Israel not. And then you also you have the immense pressure that was placed by this administration on Israel not to defend itself without the United States permission. Does a friend really do that? I thought we believed in the sovereignty of our friends, our, our nation friends, so they could make their own decisions about self-defense. I thought that's the case, and yet we keep hearing reports, reading reports, about pressure by this administration on Israel not to take action to defend itself. So that's really in that category as well, of loves Israel not. And also, the Obama administration has never rejected or condemned the racist, hateful teachings about Jewish people uh, going on in the Palestinian schools in the Middle East and in some Muslim schools here in the United States. No condemnation or rejection at all could be found anywhere. And yet, anyone that cares to see the kind of hateful biased, nasty things that are being said about Jewish and Israeli people uh, just need let our office know uh, there are people in Israel, there are websites that can provide that information. They've gotten copies of textbooks. There are commercials that are run. There are, there are great uh, events in Palestinian areas, in fact, that are even named, the events named for Palestinian terrorists, Islamic jihadists that blew themselves up and killed a lot of uh, Israelis. And yet we have no condemnation from this administration of any of that type activity. Um, Israel, of course, is repeatedly warned by this administration to, 
to be nicer to the Palestinians, and we can't find any evidence that this administration has ever warned the Palestinians, quit inciting hatred in your children for Jewish or Israeli people. And the list goes on, helping us assess the evidence of whether President Obama is for or really against Israel. Since his comment this week, he's not going to tell us anymore how he feels about Israel. We'll just look at the evidence, continue. Uh, we remember not long after President Obama went, came into office, he traveled to Turkey, to Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, apologized to them on behalf of the United States. Uh, somebody uses really good word choices, uh, a beautiful uh, group of wording about the United States being divisive and dismissive. And Anyway, really nice words. And in what many dubbed as the apology tour, uh, that, that really was not, a strong sign of love and affection for Israel. Uh, and then, then we have the fact that this president, although he went on an apology tour all around our, our so-called ally Israel, he never actually went to Israel. I don't know. You, you can't blame him. Maybe you'd be concerned that Prime Minister Netanyahu would leave him sitting around twiddling his thumbs while Prime Minister Netanyahu went and had dinner with his family. But I've met with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I'm not anybody. And yet uh, he took time and was very uh, punctual in his meeting. So I, I really don't think the president should have to worry that Prime Minister Netanyahu might try to snub him the same way. I think he would find, uh, I think President Obama would find Prime Minister Netanyahu to be very congenial, as he normally is, although, again, we go back to the president's comments when he didn't know the mic was open, um, indicating he didn't have a lot of love for having to deal with um, Prime Minister Netanyahu every day. So as for now, until we actually have a, pres a visit from President Obama to Israel, it really has to go into the loves Israel not category. And then, of course, we have the Obama administration's support for the Muslim Brotherhood's rise to power in Egypt. Uh, this administration was encouraging Mubarak to step down, get out of the way, and uh, actually made quite uh, interesting quotes uh, about the radical Islamist protesters in Egypt. But uh, anyway, they supported the Muslim Brotherhood's rise to power in Egypt and have, have uh, reached out in numerous ways to the Muslim Brotherhood, thinking that this may really be a good thing, indicating um, a great thing for the Middle East. Well, it may be a good thing for the Muslim Brotherhood, but we have the documentation, the quotes are easily accessible about what the Muslim Brotherhood truly stands for, and they want to see Israel gone. So some would say, well, it's a good thing when any administration reaches out to a people. But if that people, if the leaders of a group are demanding that a dear, close, friendly ally be wiped off of the map and have to live under a caliphate, not to Judaism, but which the president says he knows more than any other president, apparently, but live under a caliphate, uh, which, of course, as Ahmadinejad believes, the uh, 12th Imam, the Mahdi, will be coming back. And um, anyway, that, that's, that really wasn't showing a lot of love for Israel. And, of course, Israel expressed a great deal of concern. They had concerns about what was going on in, in Egypt. Mubarak... Uh, was a problematic man, problematic leader. But at least he was trying to keep up the agreement, the treaty with Israel. He at least made some pretense 
that he was trying to protect the Egyptian-Israeli border. Now we have Muslim Brotherhood who have no such intention and it didn't take an intelligence department to advise this administration of that. It certainly should have been clear. Yet in 2011, President Obama was calling the radical Islamist protesters in Egypt, quote, an inspiration to people around the world. And he stated he supported a new regime in Egypt. Well, you had radical Islamists, you had Muslim Brotherhood, and as we see in these elections as they go forward, the Muslim Brotherhood is taking charge, and they have no interest in agreeing to the treaties that have long since been made with Israel. And although they have come back and said, well, we might put it up to a vote. <laughs> well, the same people that are voting the Muslim Brotherhood into power because they know the Muslim Brotherhood wants to see Israel gone will obviously not be supporting a treaty. So those kind of comments that put Israel at such extreme risk, a risk on their border um, just cannot be deemed to be indication of a love's Israel. It's more a loves Israel not. And then we have uh, the fact that though the Syrian leader Assad has been ruthless in killing and abusing his people and has not been helpful to Israel to the extent Egyptian leader Mubarak was, this administration, the Obama administration, has failed to support the Syrian rebels the way it did the Egyptian rebels. Uh, that's really been interesting to see how that developed because, like, for example, uh, in Libya, gosh, the president said he didn't need support from Congress because there were people like NATO and the Muslim Brotherhood. There were folks that wanted us to help get rid of Gaddafi. Well, Gaddafi was... Sure, no angel, and he certainly had blood on his hands. But Gaddafi was not a threat to Israel. And this administration militarily, militarily supported the people who are a threat to Israel, unapologetically. Now, there were some games, some words, work, wordsmanship games wordsmithing went on by this administration saying, look, look, uh, this is really a NATO action. Well, guess who makes up 60% or more of the NATO military? Guess who gives more to NATO than anybody else? It's the United States. So it was a little bit of sleight of hand to say, well, you know, Libya really is more of a NATO action. It's not really us. It's very clear. This administration has not demanded the ouster of a leader with blood on his hands who continues to abuse and kill Syrians who want some freedom. They're, this administration hadn't supported those rebels the way they did in Libya and the way the administration called for Mubarak to be gone. Forcefully. So that's, that's also a loves Israel not. And then you've got to note that the Obama administration's support for giving Israel's enemy money and weapons has been at the same time Israel has been given assistance. Well, that's not showing a lot of love for Israel. But the Obama administration has supported uh, providing Israel financial aid that they can use to buy U.S. weapons for Israel's defense. Well, now there's a good one to show some love for Israel. Uh, so, we sh this administration has shown some love for Israel by uh, pushing to provide them with financial aid to buy U.S. weapons for their own defense. But unfortunately, that comes at the same time the administration keeps supporting Israel's enemies, giving them money, pushing to give them money and weapons 
at the same time Israel is getting that same assistance. And then one other thing that I think is worthy of note, I uh, believe it was two years ago, May, two years ago, I believe, uh, the Obama administration voted with Israel's enemies to require Israel to disclose any and all nuclear capabilities or weapons. Israel is a tiny country in the middle of a number of countries and hostile peoples that want to see Israel gone. And nobody has made that more clear than Ahmadinejad. And it was certainly worthy of note that it was right after this administration parted from decades of tradition of support for Israel and their very tenuous situation there in the Middle East and sided with all of Israel's enemies and vote to require them to disclose all they really had that could protect them. And, and it brought to mind that story from the uh, Old Testament about uh, King Hezekiah. And now King Hezekiah was confronted by Isaiah. And those of us who believe what's printed there believe that God sent the prophet to confront Hezekiah. And he basically said, what, what, did, what have you done with these people from Babylon? these leaders that came over from Babylon. And basically, this is Texas paraphrase, but basically saying, uh, King Hezekiah said, oh, I, I, I took these uh, Babylonian leaders around and I showed them all our treasure and I showed them all the defenses we had in the armory. And in essence, Hezekiah was told by Isaiah you fool, because you have done this, you're going to lose your country. And he did. Actually, he begged the Lord to let it not be on his watch, and it ends up being under his sons. That's another story. point here that came to mind, though, is we were demanding Israel do what Hezekiah similarly did, which made their country vulnerable and caused them to lose their country. And we voted with Israel's enemies to demand that. This administration did. Congress would never have voted a majority to do such a thing. But this Obama administration did. It's a dangerous time in the world. And it's time for America not to be stupid. Some have referred to Israel as being the free world's miner's canary. Because as people know, in the old days, before sensitive electronic equipment, canaries were taken in mines so that if noxious, poisonous gas began to fill the air, the canary would die before the miners would, and if the canary killed over dead, the miners would know they've got to get out or they could be next. Our assistance to Israel as a democracy in the middle of a hostile world, a hostile area, with people who want to see our type of freedom and liberty gone, whose very definition of the word freedom means freedom to worship under a joint caliphate and under Sharia law. But Israel's definition of freedom is like ours. We should be supporting Israel. We should not be supporting Israel's enemies. And so those who have studied history, you know that when a nation's enemies see that nation's strongest ally pulling away from them, that's when their enemies move against them. So was it any surprise that after the Obama administration voted with Israel's enemies to make Israel more vulnerable, 
that all of a sudden here came a flotilla to challenge the lawful blockade of the Gaza Strip that Israel had to ensure, or at least try to ensure, their own protection. And, of course, that was a disastrous and embarrassing time for Israel, but I can't help but believe it goes back to this administration telling Israel's enemies, we're standing with you and not with Israel. Yes, this administration has gone back and issued statements to the contrary, but when you look at the evidence, look at the unguarded evidence, look at the leaks, look at the support for whom, it still keeps coming back that even though this president says, I'm not going to answer any more questions about whether or not I support Israel, the evidence is clear. And I hope in the ensuing months between now and the next inauguration that this administration will go out of its way to assure Israel's enemies that despite the overwhelming evidence that Israel is not loved by this administration from past actions and comments, that it will take actions between now, if for no other reason, to try to help this administration win some votes that it's been losing. I don't really care what the reason is. I care about supporting our allies, supporting those who stand for liberty, who will allow freedom of worship by Muslims, freedom of worship by Christians, freedom of worship by other groups in Israel that Jews and Christians are not afforded in other countries that this administration keeps sucking up to. So the evidence seems pretty clear. It keeps coming back, despite some minor indications to the contrary, that this administration loves Israel not. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, under the uh, Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, uh, is recognized for 60 minutes up to <laughs> as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I assure you I will not use the full 60 minutes, but there is an issue which I did want to spend a few minutes uh, discussing today because it is extremely time-sensitive. As the chart next to me indicates, uh, we are today on June 1st, uh, 29 days away from the uh, increase in interest rates for the subsidized Stafford Student Loan Program, a program which today presently offers uh, middle-class college students uh, loans at a rate of 3.4 percent and on July 1st under by law um, that number will double to 6.8 percent unless Congress acts. The um, situation right now is the result of a, a measure that was passed in 2007, the College Cost Reduction Act, which at that time, again, the, the statute under the Stafford program required a 6.8 percent 
uh, uh, interest rate. And uh, I was part of a group that passed the College Cost Reduction Act that cut that rate down to 3.4%. Uh, for an average student using the stu Stafford Student Loan Program, which uh, carries a, a loan limit up to $23,000 a year for a student, that cut in interest rate saved uh, the average student who uses this program about five to ten thousand dollars in added interest costs. Obviously, a huge number for uh, young people in this country who are struggling to try and deal with the costs of, of higher education. Now, uh, again, it was a five-year bill, has a sunset date of July 1st, not uncommon in terms of the way uh, legislation is designed in Washington. Uh, but in January, President Obama, standing at that podium right behind me, reminded the Congress during the State of the Union address that this doubling of rates uh, was, uh, again, a, a few months away. And up to this point, we still have not dealt with this issue. And for young people who are trying to budget in terms of the upcoming school year, young seniors who got their acceptance letters to go to college. Uh, the failure of this Congress to address this issue and get it done is frankly just completely unacceptable. And the schedule that we have been following in this House, uh, for example, this week we had only one full session day uh, at a time when so many issues like this are piling up and crying out for action is really just uh, unacceptable. The good news is, is that there has been some movement. Uh, since the President made his call in January, January, I introduced legislation to lock in the lower rate the following day. We have 152 co-sponsors to lock in the lower rate at 3.4 percent. Uh, about three weeks ago, the uh, Republican majority did move a bill forward. It uh, was paid for, I think, completely inappropriately by dipping into a fund to pay for preventive health care. In other words, it took money out of a fund to pay for uh, cervical cancer screening, diabetes treatment, um, all the measures that are preventable illnesses in this country, uh, and which, again, Many uninsured individuals need that fund to operate to get those tests done and avoid higher health care costs. Uh, yesterday, there was, again, uh, additional movement where the uh, leadership, uh, Republican leadership in the House and the Senate uh, acknowledged that that's not going to work in terms of a way to pay for it, and two additional ideas have been put forward on the table uh, to deal with a way to offset the cost of cutting that rate from 6.8 to 3.4 percent. We'll see. Next week, the Senate is back, and uh, that really is the chamber where we may see some uh, movement uh, forward in terms of this issue. But I think it's important to note this is only a one-year fix. Uh, that is being proposed right now. And for families out there dealing with the cost of, of college, uh, saying that we're going to only provide relief for one year for, for interest rates um, is not a good enough answer. And we know that because the Federal Reserve, which tracks the amount of consumer debt that uh, families are accumulating in this country uh, just yesterday uh, reminded us that student loan debt now exceeds all other forms of consumer debt. It exceeds credit card debt. It, re it exceeds car debt. And this, this is a trajectory which is just going up and up and up. And adding to that debt level by allowing interest rates to be at a ridiculous level in the economy that we're in right now. You can go out and get a 30-year fixed mortgage on a house for about 3% or 4% right now. Certainly in Connecticut, those kinds of loans are being offered. Treasury notes are being sold, 10-year Treasury notes are being sold at record lows. Uh, yesterday it was reported 1.45% uh, was the yield rate that Treasury was selling 10-year notes. To have 6.8% with this picture in, uh, in our economy here today is just unacceptable. And, and the impact it's having in terms of the um, higher education system is tragic for our country. In the 1980s, we were number one in the world in terms of graduating people with either two-year or four-year degrees. Today, we are 12th. I mean, to think about that. The United States of America now is 12th in terms of graduating people with two-year and four-year degrees, and cost is the biggest driving factor that is preventing people from going to college and getting degrees. And when we look at the workforce needs in this country in terms of medical professions, in terms of research, in terms of uh, engineering and science, the fact of the matter is this country is in a almost crisis situation right now in terms of being able to refresh and replenish the work workforce needs of this country. Now, how did we get here? The Stafford Student Loan Program, which was created in 1965, was an attempt to try and reach out to families and give them more affordable interest rates so that they could pay for college. From 1960s to the 1990s, it was a variable rate interest rate program that went up and down with interest rates in the economy. In 2002, the Congress passed a budget law which locked in a fixed rate at 6.8%. 
Why did they do that? Well, that interest in revenue that when, when people pay back their loans actually goes into the Treasury. It, it goes into the coffers of this country. It's almost like a tax, essentially. And to cut that rate to a lower level re requires other places in, in the government to sort of offset uh, the, the uh, reduction of 6.8% to a lower rate. And the um, measure that we passed in 2007 accomplished that with a pay for because it eliminated a lot of wasteful bank subsidies and fees to make sure that that cut from 6.8% to 3.4% was actually going to take place. So we are here today in a situation where student loan debt now is the largest um, challenge that faces middle class families uh, who are trying to just do the right thing and give their children the opportunity to get the skills that they're going to need to compete in, in, in their lives and, and help our economy, by the way, uh, perform in a very uh, competitive global environment. And yet we have still not come up with a sustainable long term path in terms of trying to make college affordable. Uh, we need to address this. My bill, uh, H.R. 3826, locks in the lower rate at 3.4 percent, not just for one year, but permanently. And we also need to look at the issue of college costs. We need to start putting incentives out there in terms of federal programs to make sure that colleges are not running wild with tuition increases. And I think it's important to note that President Obama, when he gave his State of the Union address and challenged Congress to protect this lower interest rate, he coupled it with a number of reforms to the um, uh, uh, Title IV programs that pay for higher education from the federal government that basically tells universities and colleges if your tuition rates go up at an unacceptable level, you're going to be basically disqualified from participating in these programs. That's the first time that has ever been cited as, or suggested as a way of trying to put some carrots and sticks into the system right now because uh, college costs uh, are driving, uh, again, that affordability challenge and to some degree are driving that high loan levels, those high debt levels that families are almost forced to take on to pay for college. It's almost like buying a house now if you're going to a four-year private college in terms of paying the bills. So we need to, again, not just look at this issue in terms of protecting lower interest rates, which again, it looks like we may have a glimmer of hope of a one-year fix coming up uh, down the um, uh, in the Senate next week. But we also need to, frankly, have a longer term strategy for providing lower interest rates on a longer term uh, basis for middle class families. And we need to be looking at what's the driving factor in terms of college costs. We need to start creating incentives within the, the financing system to make sure that colleges are doing a better job of managing their overhead so that they, again, aren't just shifting that cost onto students and families. And again, the stakes could not be higher in terms of the success of this country. We must, as a nation, make sure that we continue to invest in our education system, in our higher education system. And I would close by just sort of uh, citing another sort of benchmark that's coming up in a short period of time. Again, as my chart indicates, on July 1st, we are going to hit the, du the doubling of the interest rates unless Congress acts. Ask, acts. Uh, what's also going to happen, though, in, on July 2nd, is that we are actually going to observe an anniversary in this country. It will be the 150th anniversary of when Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act. The Morrill Act was a law that was passed during the darkest days of the Civil War, again, a, a time when we were literally going through an existential crisis in this country about whether or not we were going to survive as a republic. And despite all of that challenge, President Lincoln was able to look above and beyond the immediate and look in the long term and sign into law this measure which created the land-grant college program. That is the program which basically said that each state must establish an institution of higher education for the purposes of propagating agricultural sciences and engineering. What an amazing uh, act for someone, again, who was fighting, whose nation was fighting for its life to see that long term we must continue to, to look uh, forward and we must invest in our future. And over time, since the Morrill Act was, was signed, we have, as a, on a bipartisan basis, we had passed the Stafford Act, the Stafford Student Loan uh, Program, which I mentioned here, which was sponsored by a Republican Senator, Robert Stafford from Vermont. We passed the Pell Grant program, named after Claiborne Pell, a Democratic senator from 
Rhode Island. We passed the Perkins Loan Program, which was named after Carl Perkins, a Democrat from Kentucky. But over time, in even the darkest, most challenging, critical days of our nation's history, uh, we have had leadership in Washington which understood that we must keep our eye on the real crown jewels of our country, which is our people. We are a nation that is blessed with great material wealth. We are a nation that is blessed with the greatest military fighting force in the, in the world. We are blessed with great financial institutions. But what really makes this country tick is, is our people, is, is investing in future generations. And that is, at the end of the day, what's at stake with this issue, which has 29 days for Congress to act and fix. Uh, I'm an optimist. I think we can do this. I think we've seen some movement. Took a little external pressure on the, on the political system here with the president's visits to college campuses in Iowa and, and North Carolina and Colorado and the ticking time clock that I've been putting on this floor day in and day out and the 130,000 petition signatures from college campuses all across the country, which we brought to the Speaker's office on day 110. That external pressure has finally gotten some movement in this issue, and hopefully next week we are really going to see the glimmers of a real solution to making sure that families are not going to see their rates double uh, to 6.8%. But again, our work is not done if we get that measure passed. We must deal with long-term sustainable solutions to the issue of higher education costs if we as a nation are going to have any viable future and success. We can do this, but it's going to take a lot of bipartisan, concerted effort to come together and solve this critical problem. With that, I yield back, Mr. Speaker. Under the uh, Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, as always, it's my privilege and honor to address you here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives and, and take up a series of issues that I think that uh, you should be considering, and I'd recommend um, that that be the case as long as uh, the broader part of the body of this Congress and the public is uh, listening into this conversation that we're having, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd make a series of points on uh, where a nation needs to focus our energy, where this Congress needs to focus this energy, and uh, how we turn this country back into the country that was envisioned by our founding fathers. And I would make the point, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we have uh, now, coming on almost four years ago, elected a, elected a president who rode into office with a large majority on, from his party in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And I warned then, going into the 2008 election, that if America elected the, and I quote this way, the ruling troika, the troika of President Obama, Majority Leader of the United States Senate Harry Reid and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, that the three of them could go into a phone booth and thereafter make a decision on what they decided to do to America without accountability that could check them in their a very active endeavor to shape America in a way that wasn't envisioned by the Founding Fathers. And lo and behold, Mr. Speaker, that is what happened. The voters in 2008 made that decision. They expanded the Democrat majority here in the House of Representatives. And they also elected Barack Obama to the presidency, the most liberal president America has ever seen, and of course maintained in a majority of Democrats in the United States Senate. And what unfolded was an effort here in the House that passed cap and trade. And we stood here on the floor, Mr. Speaker, over and over again and did battle with cap and trade. We called it cap and tax. Cap and tax was the right way to describe the bill that would tax people who were burning hydrocarbons and doing so created a disadvantage for American industry and an advantage for the industries in places like India and China where they care less about what goes into the atmosphere than we do here uh, in this country. That legislation which I will always believe we had the ability to kill, even in the House Republican minority at the time, if we had turned up all of our efforts, we had the ability to kill it, Mr. Speaker. We didn't get that done. We came close. We didn't get that done. And the, and the cap and tax legislation passed over to the United States Senate, where it was subsequently killed in the Senate. But the sentiment of the President of the United States, the Speaker of the House, then Nancy Pelosi, and the Majority Leader in the United States Senate was to impose cap and trade or cap and tax on us. And they tried. They tried mightily. And President Obama has since said that if he can't get cap and tax passed, he would say cap and trade, Mr. Speaker, that he would implement it by rule and implement it by regulation 
if the Congress will not comply with his directive. Now, we haven't heard very much about that effort in the media, not very much from the president, not very much from Democrats in this, in this Congress or uh, Democrats in the United States Senate. But it remains that this executive branch is implementing rules and regulations to carry out the initiative of cap and tax, cap and trade, which has been so rejected by the American people and exposed to be at least perpetuated by a fraud um, of, of data information that went back and forth uh, between the United Kingdom and the United States. And so that's one piece that has been coming at us. It's a result of that decision made by the voters in 2008. And as they pushed on cap and tax from that election, we saw then also that supermajority of uh, the House Democrats, Senate Democrats, and the most liberal president America has ever seen. And by the way, Mr. Speaker, I'm not making that number up. Uh, that is, uh, that it is the data that shows uh, that when they measured the votes of United States senators during the entire tenure of Barack Obama as a United States senator, which I recognize wasn't long, uh, he voted to the left of every senator in the United States Senate, including Bernie Sanders, the independent senator uh, from Vermont, who I served with in the House of Representatives. I personally like the gentleman. Uh, he's a self-professed socialist, and yet Barack Obama voted to the left of the self-professed socialist Senator Bernie Sanders and the left of every United States senator while he was a senator advancing cap and tax, cap and trade. He said that, if, that under his proposal, of cap and tax, cap and trade, that the costs of electricity generated by coal would, quote, necessarily skyrocket, close quote. Well, that's happening. They have written regulations uh, through the EPA and other means of the executive branch of government to the point now where it's been, I think, clearly established that it is, reg in a, from a regulatory perspective, it is not just virtually, Mr. Speaker, but literally impossible for a new coal-fired generating plant, no matter how clean burning that coal might be, to be constructed in the United States. We tried that in Iowa a year and a half or so ago uh, to build a plant at Marshalltown, a coal-fired plant in Marshalltown. It had the best combination of entities that you could bring together that could utilize this and the longest-term best vision you could put together with the engineering and the business model. And they finally had to, as we say in the, on the chessboard, tip over their king and concede that they couldn't build a new coal-fired plant. Now it's become ever increasingly clear that expanding coal-fired generation also is regulatorily virtually impossible, perhaps literally impossible as well. And so the cost of our electricity goes up. And the leverage that comes in on creating um, subsidized forms of energy uh, that fit within the political uh, wishes of the president uh, seems to be pushed well out of the White House. In any case, Mr. Speaker, that was one of the fights that went on here in this Congress back in those years between 2008 and the election in 2010. And, of course, another one was the passage of Obamacare. And Obamacare uh, sometimes is described as a pejorative way to, um, de to define the health care plan that the president advanced that had the full support of then-Speaker Pelosi. I would remind people of that, then-Speaker Pelosi. That legislation first came to this floor as H.R. 3200. That was the, the precursor to the final package of Obamacare. And the end, the bill that they, they define it as, two different bills, by the way, one, um, a, re a reconciliation package that was slid around the filibuster in the Senate. That's a component of Obamacare. And the other one was legislation that passed out of the House and the Senate with a supermajority in the Senate, um, that, a temporary supermajority in the Senate, I might add. And that was only passed because there was a promise made here that the president would sign an executive order that, in effect, amended legislation that the House was about to pass. Now, Mr. Speaker, if there are any civic student, students listening to this discussion, I imagine that I've just heard their jaws drop across America to think that the President of the United States, who taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago as an adjunct professor, would think that he, now as President of the United States, could sign an executive order that could amend legislation that was about, to, under the promise that it would amend legislation that was about to be passed on that condition in the House of Representatives. That took place here, right here, Mr. Speaker. That's what's happened to this country. That's what's happened to the constitutional construct of this country when you have leftist activists in charge of this government and 
They took the bit in their teeth and they ran off the cliff into the left and we ended up with Obamacare that they call the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You can walk up and down the streets of America and with the exception of right around the Capitol here in Washington, D.C., I would suggest that you wouldn't find two people in a hundred that would know what that means. Uh, we know what Obamacare means. That's the president's advance of the health care policy that takes away our constitutional right to manage our own health care. And I tell people often that Obamacare needs to be repealed for a lot of reasons. It's unaffordable. It's unsustainable. It does set up rationing. Sarah Palin was right. It reduces research and development. It means that America will no longer be the lead in the innovation and health care systems in the world. All of those things are, are, are bad and wrong and unsustainable about it. And, 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 but the worst thing is that Obamacare is unconstitutional. It's a direct assault. It's a direct assault on Americans, on our sovereign right. And Mr. Speaker, the most sovereign thing that any of us have in the United States or any place in the world is our own soul. We, we protect that. We decide. That's freedom of religion that's in the First Amendment in the United States Constitution. Take care of your soul. That's sovereign. Second most sovereign thing we have is our health, our bodies, our skin, and everything inside it. And what is Obamacare? They went in and nationalized Chrysler. They nationalized General Motors. For a time, they nationalized three large investment banks, AIG, Freddie, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the entire... Uh, entire flood uh, insurance program in the United States and the student loan program in the United States, all of that taken over by the federal government in the last few years. And then Obamacare came along, and that is, Mr. Speaker, the nationalization of your skin and everything inside it, and a 10% tax on the outside if you go to the tanning salon, just to add a little extra insult to injury. That's what Obamacare has done. It has tapped into this vigorous American people, the most vigorous people the world has ever seen. We've skimmed the cream of the crop off of every donor civilization on the planet and gotten the best that any civilization had to offer because they were inspired by the, the American dream, inspired by those visions that are embodied within the Statute of Liberty, in the Statue of Liberty. Those visions all together attracted people to come here to this country so they could live free, be free, breathe free, and do as they will in a free enterprise system that has the rule of law, freedom of speech, religion, and the press and assembly, and no double jeopardy, and tried by a jury of your peers, and states' rights that flow down to the states or the people respectively. All of that is a promise of America. And when you come to America and you embrace that promise, then you can work to it, work to achieve the American dream. But the federal government taking over the nationalization of our bodies takes that away from us. And the 1,300 health insurance companies that we had two and a half years ago when the ruling Troika imposed Obamacare on this country are fewer now. The 100,000 possible health insurance policies that were out there on the marketplace that one could choose from are fewer now. And the government stepped in and reached more. And just yesterday I got the news that Nemshoff Company, which is a subsidiary of the Herman Miller Incorporated, it provides 111 jobs in, up in uh, Sioux Center, Iowa. 111 jobs building, making furniture and other equipment, a lot of it that goes into medical clinics and hospitals, a specialized type of a, of a production facility. 111 jobs will close its doors. It will close its doors because, and they cited, Mr. Speaker, Obamacare. The uncertainty and the cost and the burden of the imposition of, the, of Obamacare upon a company that's building products for health care causes them to shut their doors down. They didn't give any other reason. I didn't talk with them. I didn't solicit this. That was what came out in their press release and I learned it when I read the paper. Because Obamacare forces them in a situation where they're shutting down a company that's been there for years and it has 111 jobs, well, the profit has been taken out of it for them. That's why the plant has to be closed. And we need to remember that this economy doesn't function to produce jobs. 
This economy and this free enterprise system we have functions to give a return on capital. When capital is invested, it needs to be invested with an anticipation that there will be profits. And that anticipation for profits is what brings about jobs. And keeping those jobs competitive is what is an incentive to produce the expanses in technology so that America can be the innovators for the world and the most competitive economy in the world. But this administration seems to believe that you can't have a business model unless you can have the government at the table and the government will decide what kind of health insurance policy you can buy and that you shall buy it and that, it, that there's an individual mandate in Obamacare that takes away our constitutional rights and that's the unconstitutional takings of the most, second most sovereign thing we have which is our skin and everything inside it. And if the Supreme Court and I believe, Mr. Speaker, they will make a prudent constitutional decision, and I anticipate that decision uh, very early, or well, say, I'll say next month sometime. I anticipate that decision. They will be deliberating on this, that the Constitution defines a limited government. The principle of federalism, the principle of federalism isn't to grow the federal government, it's to limit the size of the federal government and for those powers to be devolved down to the, as close to the people as possible. The federal government should be the last resort, not the first option. And if you can take care of things at the family level, take care of it at the family level. If you can't do that, take care of it at the friend level. If you can't do that, do so in your church, do so in your neighborhood, do so in your school, do so in your community, do so in your county, and if you can't do that, do so in your state. But as a last desperate resort, the federal government then maybe can step in if the cause is high enough and there's a constitutionally enumerated power to do so. But this enumerated power of the Commerce Clause is where the proponents of Obamacare pointed to argue that they have the constitutional authority to require every American that fits within their defined category to buy a health insurance policy that's approved by Barack Obama with the mandates on it that are approved by Barack Obama, which, by the way, include, by presidential edict, legislation by, not executive order, not legislation by, from the bench, as we sometimes complain about with an activist judicial branch, the President of the United States legislated by press conference. When he directed Kathleen Sebelius to issue the order that even our faith-based organization, and, I'm, and especially our Catholic uh, health and care providers, but it also includes many of the Protestant organizations, that they shall provide contraceptives, sterilizations, and abortifacients, and they shall do so free of charge, that it should be a part of every health insurance policy. So, Mr. Speaker, can you imagine if you were a if you were someone who had committed your life to Christ, for example, a celibate priest, a celibate nun, you're required to provide contraceptives for those who are not. When, and if it violates your religious convictions, whether or not you wear a collar, we can't discriminate in favor of someone who happens to be a professional reverend or pastor or a bishop or a cardinal and a lay person on the street whose convictions may be as deep it needs to have the same conscience protection from a religious perspective. And so for the federal government to step in and declare, you're going to provide health care services, you're going to buy this health insurance policy, and you will guarantee that it will cover contraceptives, sterilizations, and abortifacients, abortion-causing drugs, for every one of your employees, even if you're in the business to oppose the very idea of abortion-causing drugs. The president got the political pushback on that, Mr. Speaker. And over a couple weeks period of time of taking the, taking the crossfire that came from across this country directed at the White House for the audacity to make that declaration, the president held a press conference. At, on, it was at noon on a Friday, several weeks ago now. And he said this, I'm going to make an accommodation to the religious organizations. And therefore rather than requiring Catholic Health Services, for example, to provide abortion-causing drugs and sterilizations and Cadillac contraceptives, I'm going to instead make that accommodation and require the insurance companies to do that for free. Now, you heard me say a little bit ago, legislation by press conference, Mr. Speaker, and I say that because of this. The rule that was issued by Health and Human Services' Kathleen Sebelius 
that impose this thing on the religious health care providers especially, that rule was never changed. The language is identical to what it was. There's not an I dotted differently or a T crossed differently. The rule is the same. So the only thing that changed was the president did a press conference and said, okay, I'm going to cut you some slack, religious organizations. I'm going to make an accommodation to you, and I'm now going to require the insurance companies to provide it for free. He repeated himself, for free. The audacity. King George would not have the audacity to step up and do a press conference 230 years ago and say to America, well, regardless of what the parliament thinks, I'm just going to go ahead and require you to, uh, let's say, buy tea at the rate that the, uh, that the British would like us to buy. No, there'd be a tea party in Boston Harbor if that happened. Well, there's going to be a tea party in this country too, only it's going to take place in November. And the American people will reflect upon what has happened over these last three plus going now on four years. The imposition of Obamacare on all of America without regard to the Constitution and the restraint, requiring people to buy a health insurance policy that's approved by the federal government that has mandates that are stuck into it by what? Not by legislative action, not by a rule approved by the United States Congress, by an executive branch that's directed out of the White House to write up the rules however they see fit, and a president that has the audacity, and that's one of his favorite words, by the way, Mr. Speaker, the audacity to seek to legislate by press conference, edicts by press conference. It is breathtaking the extra constitutional reach that's been taken by this president and this administration, and this country needs to rise up and get back to our constitutional underpinnings. We need to reject Obamacare. I want to see this House vote again this summer after the Supreme Court decision, no matter what the Supreme Court decision is, and I'm optimistic about getting a constitutional decision from the Supreme Court, but I want to see this Congress vote again for a 100% repeal of Obamacare so everybody's on record, everybody understands that it must all go, it must all be pulled out by the roots, there can be no vestige of Obamacare left behind, it's an unconstitutional takings of American liberty, excuse me, in a vigorous nation, Mr. Speaker, cannot reach our destiny if we are tied to the anchor of Obamacare that directs and rules our lives and consumes about 17 or more percent of our gross domestic product, excuse me. <coughs> and so the difference is this. The troika, the troika of, <coughs> of Harry Reid Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, has been broken. It was broken in the election of 2010 when they saw the extra constitutional reach of Obamacare. They saw the effort on cap and trade. They saw Dodd-Frank pass through the House and the Senate and become law, an overreach. Uh, you had the people involved in the solution for the economic downward spiral that were contributing to the problem. There are a whole series of things we need to put this right, Mr. Speaker. One of them is um, to scrub out the regulations that have been put in place in an effort to try to implement cap and trade around the resistance of this United States Congress. The separation of powers that's clear in the Constitution itself between the legislative and the executive and the judicial branches of government. I'm just very confident that Barack Obama taught those separations of powers, that the, that the Article I component of this, it says, here's, this is how we set up the legislature, they set the laws, they set the policy, and the, the establishment of the executive branch of government, whose job it is, is to carry out the laws and take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And we have a president who apparently encourages someone like Eric Holder to disregard especially immigration laws and only enforce those laws that, let me say, do not make them politically vulnerable. They've decided they had 300,000 people that were in this country illegally 
that had been already adjudicated for deportation, and they said, we don't have the resources to enforce the law against everybody that's here illegally. And so they commit their resources to going back through the files, looking through 300 adjudicated for deportation. Typical student loan might be twenty-four thousand, might be thirty thousand dollars, but she's got a forty-four thousand dollar loan and a mortgage on her head with interest accumulating every day, and she's just drawn her first breath. And by the time she turned a year old, her share of the national debt was forty-eight thousand dollars. And this little blonde-haired, brightest blue-eyed little girl with a beautiful giggle and smile doesn't know what kind of responsibility has been stuck on her by people that are living today at her expense and the expense of all of those babies that have been born and those yet to be born that will be taxpayers and only about half of them fit that category today and so mr speaker that little girl turned a year and a half old and now her forty four thousand dollar debt that was forty eight thousand on her first birthday it became fifty one thousand dollars when she's a year and a half old and she's going to be a taxpayer and a producer and so you have to take that times two because only half the people have a federal income tax liability. $102,000 on the head of every American, young and old, is part of That's our national debt. And we've watched trillion dollar deficits roll up over the last three and a half years. The president's budget came to this floor at $1.33 trillion in deficit. $1.33 trillion, Mr. Speaker. And now we're approaching $16 trillion in national debt, and it's got to stop. We have to turn this country around. The American voters spoke in 2010. They sent 87 freshmen here into this House of Representatives who are constitutional conservatives, and every one of them voted to repeal Obamacare, and they want a balanced budget. They want a balanced budget amendment. They are God's gift to America. We need another one in November of 2000 and, uh, 2012, 
and more fresh faces and more vigorous people here that will adhere to repeal of Obamacare, a balanced budget amendment, an all of the above energy plan, and we need more of the same kind of people in the United States Senate and a president that will sign that legislation into law. I look forward to the privilege to work with those new faces as they arrive here and work to make the case before the American people every day from now until November and thereafter. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate your attention and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gen does the gentleman have a motion? Mr. Speaker, I move the House do now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The